Rachel Waddingham is next. Thank you. Um, I'll just make this work. I'm too tall. <laughs> Hi. Um, thank you so much for inviting me to speak today. Um, before I start, I just wanted to just say that this morning has left me kind of emotional, but emotions are good. And it's the first academic presentation that's also felt very emotional, so thank you for that. It feels very validating that people are looking at the embodiment of voices and not just the idea that they're words that speak to me. It's more than that, so thank you. But I'm here for a reason. I'm here to talk about hearing voices groups um, within prisons, but particularly what we can learn from that. Um, some of you might know that I've been working within prisons doing hearing voices groups now since 2010. And I don't know, this is, this is a project I've talked about in the World Hearing Voices Congress before, so I'm not going to go into great detail about how we set up and what we do. Although if there are people that are interested and want to talk with me later, I'd be very happy to do that. But the basics are that in 2010, we, we had an idea we wanted to take hearing voices groups to a place where they just don't happen, prisons. It made no sense to us that when you're in prison, you're taken away from every single coping strategy almost that you have and incarcerated, put under a lot of pressure, yet you don't get the support that you need to work through that. So we recognise the importance in, in just creating spaces in what can be a very unsafe environment. So our dream was to go into prisons, not to provide the groups ourselves and then leave after the funding finishes, but to go in and change the system, change the culture, to get prison officers, to get nurses, to get activity coordinators excited by this movement that I find so exciting. We wanted to get these people facilitating the groups alongside us so that they began to see people who hear voices in very different ways. They get to see what we see here, you know, the awesomeness of this. Not disrespecting the intensity and overwhelmingness of these experiences sometime, but emphasising that this connection that we have is something very special. So we now have about five groups in prisons in the UK, well, in England. We've got um, four groups in London, and we've also got one in Leicestershire now, which is kind of exciting. This is in a male lifers prison, which, if that doesn't translate too well, it's basically a prison people go after they've done something pretty extreme and will spend much of their lives within that institution. Um, I visited that group a few weeks ago, so it's still very much in my head. Um, we're part of, I'm part of Minding Camden, a voluntary sector organisation, a charity. And this project is funded by charitable trust, so we don't have government money or money from the NHS. We do this independently. So why did we set up Hearing Voices Groups in Prison? You can see that my slides are not very wordy. <laughs> um, obviously because they're needed. Because... Unsurprisingly, um, at least in England, we now recognise that about 15% of women in prison have what has been termed psychotic symptoms, um, or voices, or, or difficult experiences, and about, I think it's about 10% of men, but I'm sure it's much more than that. And as I've said, people have been removed from their coping strategies. And this is a place where hopelessness is rife. A little ray of hope, a little space to create a cheesy plant is a good thing. But what are these groups like? Are they different to community groups? You know, because many of you guys have been part of community groups. They're kind of the same, except for the locks, except for the keys that I wear, which makes me feel very different to the people who are within the group, except that at the end of the group, people have to go back to a cell rather than their home or go for a walk. They're the same. They're just a group of people coming together, trying to respect one another, and sharing with openness and, and real courage. Perhaps the difference I've noticed is that people need these groups so much that they value the space. When we set up the groups, we were told that these people are too unwell to take part. They don't play well with others. 
that's not the case, <laughs> obviously. But they meet each week, um, sometimes in inpatient units, so hospitals within the prisons, sometimes in the open location. Um, some prisons have people coming in and out, so they're very fluid groups. You have people coming for two weeks and then leaving, which is great. I like it when people leave. <laughs> um, some groups are much more long-term. We have people for years. But what I have noticed is the difference, I guess, from the community groups that I facilitate is that they're intense. Community groups can be intense, but some of the prison groups are particularly so. I think they've really helped me as a human being and as a facilitator to confront some of the issues that perhaps I struggled with without realising. Issues around power, issues around guilt, and issues around hopelessness. I really value Will's talk on that as well. I think that's really important. The power thing comes from the idea of being in a prison. Is you're in a powerless environment. You can't make choices about some basic things that we take for granted. But also to be locked up in your cell at night, to have voices coming at you through the walls, to have things on your skin to be held down but not to be able to scream for help or, or sit next to a loved one. That's powerless personified. You know, that's intense. And to hear those experiences and to go, I have no idea how I would deal with that. Because I honestly don't. You know, that's honest. So, again, the hopelessness that that can engender. It's helped me confront guilt. The guilt that I think many of us feel that have been traumatised. I'm not going to cry at that bit. Yeah, it's all good. Um... But also the guilt of the parts of us that feel that we've done something wrong. I think within the prison groups, if, well, I say many of the people I meet have, are in for fraud or they're in for things not related to their voices at all, just to kind of break a stereotype. But there are some people I meet who are in prison because they've acted on their voices. Or at least that's the story. The truth is they're in prison for the same reason that other people do violent things they've been oppressed, they're angry, they're struggling, they were taking drugs and, and things built up to a, a crescendo that they couldn't deal with. But imagine doing something that you can't take back, that apologising doesn't make it go away. And I think then having the voice of the person that you've hurt speaking to you while you're locked in your cell, that you cannot escape that, it's, it's tough. And finally, hopelessness, this idea that I think hope is a really essential word that we use a lot within the Hearing Voices movement, but it's so difficult for people perhaps to find that hope when they don't know when they'll be released and they don't know if their families will ever want anything to do with them. This is not a happy talk, is it? It sounds really bad. <laughs> but I think it's important to confront these experiences because I've learned from them and because if we create safe spaces, we can all learn from them. So I'm going to tell you a few of my experiences. These are my experiences, not the experiences of the people that I've worked with, because they're not here to speak for themselves, so I'm not going to try and represent that. I remember the first time I had to confront, I guess, hopelessness within the group. I'd somehow managed to ignore it up until this point. It was when someone came into the group and told me that they'd stopped eating. They were on a hunger strike. And it was because or well, my experience of, of what they were saying was it was because they were in prison for pretty much the rest of their life. They'd killed somebody that they loved and also their family would never speak to them again. So they had no reason to go on and they felt it was torture to, to make them go on. My response to this, I guess, I tried to listen, I tried to hear and I tried to feel. But I'm sad to say what I actually did was try and give someone hope when they don't feel it. This is possibly the most stupid thing that I've ever done. No, there's probably other things. But it wasn't a helpful thing. What I did, I don't actually remember what I said, but I know I said something fudgy. You know, that when you say something based on anxiety or insecurity and you try and go, but the future, or, you know, hang in there, you never know what will happen. Something stupid. And rightly, what that person said to me was, you don't effing, I'm not going to swear because I'm being all chilled right now, but you don't know what it's like. How dare you say that to me? And I thankfully said, yes, you're right. I'm really sorry about that. But I took it away and I thought about it. Then.
then a few years later, the same situation, well, a different situation, another person, another hunger strike, and a person feeling completely hopeless. And this time, hopefully, I'd learned, and I said nothing about hope. I said nothing about the future. And all I said is, if you want us to be here with you, this group is here, I'll be here, we'll be here. We'll, yeah, we'll just sit with you and whatever you do is your choice. And that was a hard thing to say because it felt like I was telling her, please die. But that was my anxiety, not what her anxiety was, and it seemed to be kind of useful. I think, yeah, I think that was kind of the, the thing that I've learned the most, and this is where I get to, what have the groups taught me? The groups have taught me everything. I thought I was an okay facilitator when I went into prison hearing voices groups. I realised I kind of wasn't. I probably shouldn't say that standing up at the front of it. It sounds like a confessional, doesn't it? But sometimes we can believe we're okay at something and feel very positive about the way that people say, thank you, this group is very helpful, that people leave with a sense of community and feel that we've got a part in that. But I think what it's taught me is about humility and to recognise that it's not me as a facilitator that is has any... has the kind of... It's, it's not giving the input here, it's the space and it's the connection. So it's taught me really to value that. I think it's taught me to listen to myself. I've had to work out why it is when people talk about this profound sense of hopelessness and guilt, why it is that that on some level makes part of me uncomfortable. Because in listening to that, I've been able to go on my own journey of healing to really talk to those voices, those parts, those aspects of myself that are still feeling guilty, that still feel like dying. Because only in healing myself and on the journey of healing myself can I actually be useful to anybody else. I think they've taught me that what we do in the Hearing Voices movement is incredibly precious that it's this vibrant thing that, that we need to nurture and not allow our anxieties to, to kind of contain or constrain or focus. And the importance of sitting with uncertainty and not knowing what someone's been through, not pretending we need to know what someone's been through, but just being with, not acting on. And I think finally, it's taught me about the bystander effect. <laughs> When you're in oppressive systems, or when I'm in oppressive systems, I've noticed that the hopelessness, the feelings of oppression and powerlessness can kind of envelop the room. As, as people talk, everyone starts to feel as if nothing can be done, and I as a facilitator can start to feel that too, and that's okay. But that can sometimes lead to not acting when things needed to be acted on, to not challenging what needs to be challenged, to not stand up and provide information and, and almost break that spell of hopelessness. But equally, it can also lead to acting too much, to running around the prison trying to get someone help when you realise that actually maybe it's the conversation with the person that's the important thing and they might want to seek their own help. It's the times where we run <laughs> rather than stop and think. And this is a very quick presentation, I hope, because it's, a, it's been a long, long but amazing morning. What do I think we as a Hearing Voices movement and other Hearing Voices groups in the community can learn from the work in prisons? I guess I'm sometimes surprised when, when I do Hearing Voices training in the community that many amazing people are frightened by this, this fluidity and uncertainty within hearing voices groups, and I can really recognise that too. So sometimes we do things like put protocols in place, you know, topics and themes that we've got to cover. We, we kind of fill the space and the, that anxiety with something that we feel will make it safe for everybody. And sometimes, inadvertently, we lose the thing that we value the most, the connection. So I guess what I've learnt and what I hope we can all learn from some of the things in prisons is to kind of go back to basics and think, why do we need a hearing voices group? I'm probably preaching to the choir here, I know this. Um, but what, why do we need these spaces? And we need them because we have many voices, but equally we have no voice or a very minimised voice. Yet 
we're strong because we've survived this long in our lives. And everyone that comes to a Hearing Voices group is incredibly strong. I've met some of the most amazing people in this journey. And if we can keep the space, protect it, nurture it, but also keep it alongside others so we're not dominating it, we can do kind of amazing things. The, sometimes, hmm, what should I say? Yeah, yeah. Just check it in. Um, and then getting lots of other things that I could say. I'm trying to, th you know when you're trying to say something kind of like impassioned and, and sensible at the end of a talk? Having that moment. But I guess what I'm saying is we don't need that. <laughs> That's probably it. This is why. Because I was going to say something and one of my voices was like, stop. <laughs> um, yeah, actually, we don't need, we do need campaigning. We need action. We need social change. But I think hearing voices groups need to be protected as this space that is what it is. It's basic, it's not rocket science, it's certainly not therapy, but it can change people's lives. And then together we can change the world. Thank you very much. <laughs>